Hello, welcome to this uh, presentation. My name is Christian Goodman. I'm very happy to be here and talk about AI and startups and innovation. Um, uh, just to introduce myself quickly, um, I have been working with AI for almost 25 years. I have been working in startups, uh, I've been starting my own startups, worked in innovation centers uh, across the world in many different big labs, such as uh, with companies such as Hewlett Packard and Ericsson and Tieto Every focusing always on innovation, focusing always on value-add um, systems and products that we can add to the market and add to the portfolio of the company. And I also have a PhD in AI, uh, worked at Monash University and many other universities in the world, so uh, it has been a very exciting journey and I'm very happy to share some of my, uh, some of my experiences here. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. Also a quick uh, introduction to the Nordic Artificial Intelligence Institute. It's one of the leading European institutes uh, in Europe uh, where we are looking very much mostly at AI uh, and also innovation and how this is adding to the ecosystem. Uh, what we are doing there among many things is mentoring um, and advising startups and businesses. Uh, we also advising uh, venture capitals and family holding companies and investing in companies such as AI and startup companies uh, and we also offer frameworks and roadmaps for uh, governments and for big companies that um, are utilizing and starting a journey in AI, particularly companies that are uh, just, let's say, they are more the traditional companies that are not yet in the digital data and AI world. So the goal of this lecture, uh, my goal will be that I uh, discuss important components for you to be successful in engaging in, a, in, a, in an innovation value-driven journey that could be a startup, um, of course, and um, increasing your awareness of how to succeed and what are the surrounding conditions uh, for you to succeed. So how can you navigate and use the ecosystem around you? Uh, specifically, three points that I will discuss. Number one, the support network. Whom should you surround yourself with? Um, who are the key people that can help you on this journey? Um, the second point will be technology and infrastructure, being aware of what's available in the environment in which you want to start your journey in creating value. And the third one is actually culture. Uh, so how do you create the culture? What can you enable either within your own startup, what you're creating there, or what you can do in a, in a larger company? Um, so these are the three topics. So support networks, uh, technology, infrastructure, and culture. So let's go a little bit deeper, speaking about the support network. Um, I think one very important part, and that is also my experience, I should say that I have been part of several startups, of course my own, but I'm also now in the position, in the very privileged position of supporting lots of startups and innovation centers uh, in Europe and around the world. Um, and um, my experience is that many of these startups, in order to be faster and achieve their goals and their targets and their roadmaps, benefit greatly from an expert, um, from an expert team. Uh, and that includes advisors that have gone down the same path. Um, so I'm, one of my startups was in, in healthcare and AI. And I'm now advising startups that are also in this area, healthcare and AI, well-being, um, and there's a very rigorous exchange of the experiences that I have had and what sort of, you know, learnings that I have, I've essentially accumulated over the time. So very rigorous exchange. Uh, on that level, uh, you can get a lot of legal advice. Um, I went recently also through um, helping a company looking at an approval in the U.S., expanding into the U.S. What does it entail? Does it even make sense? Uh, it was specifically for a medical uh, assessment, uh, looking at the FDA and uh, looking at whether or not this makes sense to go through. Um, but also being wise about whom you take on board, right? Um, advisors are one very important part in legal experts. Um, there is a tendency sometimes to think, oh, we need big names to be uh, part of the board, board or advisors, but be practical, you know? Think about who can truly help you achieve the next target of your, uh, of your endeavor. But if it is a startup, think about, well, what's the milestone that you would like to achieve? And which advisor or uh, which person can help you uh, in order to achieve that goal? So very important. Of course, there's much more to the support network. For example, uh, incubators and um, 
angel investors and, uh, and many other support functions. But advisors can be extremely helpful because they have walked the way um, already and can share their experiences. Um, last reflection on that, I mean, my experience, as I mentioned before, is very wide. Every startup that I'm working with um, and any innovation initiative that I'm working with has quite different requirements as to how to succeed and what they need. Some of them need investment, some of them need um, an assessment about the American market. Others have a bottleneck when it comes to talent, how to track talent, particularly AI, uh, data science, AI talent, software engineering talent to the company. And so different priority essentially um, makes sense for every individual company. So that's the support network, very important. Um, the second part I would like to talk about is technology and infrastructure. Um, I gave a talk recently reflecting about what's the difference between the Nordic countries where I'm currently living and Stockholm and, and Germany and other countries in Europe. So what do you have available and what do you not have available? Um, I'm just comparing briefly here. Uh, one reflection was that, for example, Sweden, Finland, the uh, penetration of, uh, let's say, um, internet cover coverage, um, 4G networks, uh, access to the internet is very, very high. It's 100% coverage. And I must say, now I'm in, uh, in Germany, and um, just to be slightly reflective, you know, the coverage is not as good here. So I'm, I'm still having issues. And that practically means I'm having um, issues to using MS Teams or Google Meet and so on as when I'm in the train. Um, and so, so these types of things are influencing the way how you can develop your technology and how you can make it available to customers um, in the ecosystem. Uh, so this is one big, I would say, advantage of the Nordic uh, countries. And I think it's also partly driven, of course, by companies like Ericsson and Nokia and Telia and so on, uh, which have been really driving this ecosystem and, the, and these types of platforms, making it available for everyone. But these are important things to consider when it comes to technology. Cloud uh, uh, providers and cloud technology is a similar issue where certain countries and certain companies have decided to uh, not use um, cloud providers from outside the EU, which really limits their choices. But many startups um, and many big companies struggle with offering services that are then based on non-EU uh, uh, cloud technology, as an example. So these are some technology and infrastructure questions to consider. Um, the last point when it comes to technology and infrastructure is probably now overlapping slightly with the culture, but uh, in the Nordic countries, uh, as an example, many uh, citizens are very happy and willing uh, to share information, their personal number. It's a concept called the personal number, probably interesting for some of you listening here, uh, in a sense that you can access your bank account, your healthcare information, your H&M uh, um, platform. You can access all of these things with just one personal number and one app. So you have a pretty um, neat, complete platform where anywhere in the world you can access this information very easy. And that, of course, allows for um, a quite a neat infrastructure uh, where certain startups like Klarna, for example, are able to predict certain things like you, uh, your credit, uh, credit rating and so on. And so they make, they make their business, Klarna is one of these big AI unicorns or unicorns in the Nordics, and they essentially make their business by predicting how financially viable you are when it comes to uh, providing uh, services to you and making a decision as to whether or not they take the responsibility of um, paying the uh, online transaction and the online products first. So um, this is technology and infrastructure. Uh, it's worthwhile considering in which environment you are. Uh, if you're starting here in Germany, in Munich or Berlin or Hamburg, uh, then it is worth reflecting on it in which environment you are. It might be that your great idea would work in other types of environments, but that is one consideration. Another, and, and now the third topic is really culture, probably one of the, um, one of the areas that I have become more and more aware of, um, both as a culture, as a country culture, as a company culture and a startup culture. Um, if you are starting a project or you're part of an initial project or startup yourself or driving it even, uh, then you, um, my experience is that this startup company builds up a pretty unique structure, a pretty unique culture. Like how do you, how do you incentivize people? How do you empower people? What type of meeting structures do you have? Um, 
how do you uh, how do you drive and measure progress, for example? And I've seen a very vi wide variety of implementations of these types of structures. And of course, as with many companies now, you will find a lot of resources. I'm happy to link to provide links to uh, certain um, um, company cultures that exist today, like Google and Amazon and Facebook. They have all quite different setups uh, in, as to how they work and how they communicate with each other, uh, as, as an example. So, and that often stays the same. So I've been supporting and advising startup companies now. Some of them are five or seven years old and the founders have really shaped this structure. Um, another, another topic with culture for established companies that are starting to engage into innovation. Um, I myself have been a vice president and global head of AI at a big IT company. And we have been building a structure where we had an open environment and individuals in the organization, entrepreneurs could come to us, so intrapreneurs could come to us and start building, a, um, building their ideas into projects, providing an environment and a, and a pitch essentially for them to receive resources and then to prove their point within a certain period of time. Um, other companies in the Nordics, and I'm quite closely related to some of them, heads of AI at H&M, Ericsson, uh, Volvo, and so on. Um, just to mention one example uh, of a culture influencing the way how an AI innovation process is happening uh, would be H&M. Uh, they have introduced something called the fountainhead method, meaning they realized, number one, that their own culture ever since H&M started a very long time back is uh, the idea of democ democratizing um, fashion. So anyone is participating in creating uh, and using fashion and, and clothes and so on. So the same idea then was applied to democratization of AI and data science services uh, combined with the, with the realization that uh, resources are scarce like data scientists, AI scientists, machine learning engineers, software architects, very, very hard to come by. And the roadmap and the strategy that H&M laid out uh, was very valuable use cases, was asking for far too many resources that are simply not available in the ecosystem. So what they have started, started to implement is essentially uh, something they refer to as the fountainhead method, meaning they uh, enable everyone in the company to use the AI capabilities that they have built in the core team. Um, so that means in practice that you have sort of low code environments. Anyone that is not a tech person can actually start utilizing um, AI services. So for example, prediction of certain sales, right? This is a capability that they might then use in a certain environment in sales or in shops and so on. Uh, and there's a big focus on uh, service, data, code, um, uh, which are all reusable, essentially stored and in, in a structure and then reutilized in the organization as easy as possible. So fountain, fountainhead method, meaning you activate as many uh, people in the organization as possible to utilize this, um, this technology. Um, then what I also said, what I also have, um, what I recommend on what I see as being very successful in my experience is developing a strong vision uh, for your company, for your project. Uh, and that means that it needs to be very tangible. It needs to be easy to absorb. Uh, and the effect of having a strong vision means that you can entice talent. Uh, they want to be, today, they want to be part of something that has purpose, that has meaning, uh, that has really something to contribute to the world. It's often not just a paycheck, but it's a journey that they engage in. What experiences will they be part of when they're engaging in your, in your project, in your startup? Very important. Of course, the, the additional effects are that you are uh, also enticing customers and investors. So a, a strong vision, very important. And in fact, if I may reflect uh, further, and it's also important for startups and innovation projects, we need this leadership on higher levels, like the government levels or CEO levels, to which I feel um, is we are lacking a little bit of that. And I'm speaking here of a type of JFK's type uh, vision, mm. visionary statement uh, that are um, focusing on big, ambitious moon, moonshot projects, literally moonshot projects, where you say, hey, we bring a man to the moon and back alive. Uh, and you know that you don't even have the technology, but it brings people together on one journey with one focus, very important. Um, and then maybe a last point on the cultural 
aspect, uh, which is um, being aware of the culture of your initial uh, customers. Uh, I mentioned before, um, data sharing is one of those aspects and the utilization of AI uh, is, an, is an aspect where certain populations and um, countries in the world are more open or less open to. Um, we have done uh, several um, market surveys in the Nordic countries, in Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, and ask thousands of citizens um, on, on their attitude towards using AI services in healthcare and retail and finance, uh, explaining to them the benefits and explaining uh, to them um, what essentially what sort of implications this would have. And uh, we have done this now regularly every year and we see an improvement of the attitude uh, of citizens in the Nordic countries towards this technology. And that in implies also towards sharing data and information. So if you can show that the data um, that you're collecting can bring immediate value, such as many uh, successful companies today, like the Amazons, Meta, and, and others, which are showing immediate value to the users in these types of environments, uh, then this can um, give people a clear idea as to why they should share this data. I'm aware that, for example, in Germany, it's not as easy to do these things due to also historical reasons. Uh, but yet again, this shows um, that you are, that you need to be aware uh, of the culture environment and consider which, which market would be your beachhead market um, in your environment. And uh, I mentioned Klarna before, so this is just one important example where uh, the Swedes and the Nordic countries are quite open to share this type of data. And that has brought forward uh, the company Klarna, which is one of these unicorns that have existed in the Nordic countries. To summarize, I have been speaking now about three points related to the AI innovation ecosystem, um, the support networks, uh, the technology and infrastructure, uh, and also cultural aspects and components that are important to build a successful startup and innovation project. Um, so with that, I was achieving or wanting to achieve that you understand certain components better in your startup journey, in your innovation journey, um, increase awareness, uh, and also enable you to navigate and use the ecosystem that you're in uh, in order to be more successful with your company. Um, I would encourage you, if you have more questions, I will add links to this um, MOOC and to this presentation, which I hope are useful. Um, some of them will be to the uh, Nordic AI ecosystem, examples of startups and companies that have been successfully implementing AI, big companies and also startup companies. And I will also add some podcasts, uh, um, which I have given myself, but also uh, many of these big companies that you know from the Nordic countries, where the leaders of AI have also provided and shared their insights and their expertise. Uh, one of them is, for example, something um, which is called the AI After Work podcast, which is which is run in a type of Joe Rogan format, a very, very um, entertaining and very nice uh, talk and discussion, which is actually, in my case, it went over three hours, I, th I think, where we had uh, two wines and discussed uh, a lot on AI and how you're successful with AI startups. So um, that is my contribution for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to reach out. Um, have a look at the Nordic AI Institute website, and I wish you a fantastic day. Thank you.